Welcome to our lecture on protein structure elucidation. Currently, there are three major methodologies for analyzing the three-dimensional structure of proteins, including X-ray crystallography, nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR imaging, and cryo-electron microscopy. All of these methodologies are incredibly complex and intricate to learn. We will just take a look at the basics of each and discuss some of their pros and cons. With X-ray crystallography, the process begins by crystallizing a protein of interest. Crystallization of the protein causes all the protein atoms to be oriented in a fixed way with respect to one another, while still maintaining their biologically active conformations. This fixed crystal structure is a requirement for X-ray diffraction. To form protein crystals, the protein solution must be supersaturated to start forming nuclei. It is a difficult and often timely process to find the right parameters for crystal growth and formation. Once they have formed, they can be bombarded with X-rays and the diffraction pattern recorded. The structure is then recreated from the diffraction map using Fourier transformation. High quality structures have two angstrom resolution. A stereo image of the HIV protease bound to its inhibitor is shown in B on the right. This structure was solved by X-ray crystallography. By analyzing the structure, researchers were able to start designing new protease inhibitors. NMR spectroscopy is another method commonly used to help elucidate the 3D structure of proteins. Currently, most samples are examined in a solution in water, but methods are being developed to also work with solid samples. Data collection relies on placing the sample inside a powerful magnet, sending radio frequency signals through the sample, and measuring the absorption of those signals. Depending on the environment of atoms within the protein, the nuclei of individual atoms will absorb different frequency of the radio signals. Furthermore, the absorption signals of different nuclei may be perturbed by adjacent nuclei. This information can be used to determine the distance between nuclei. These distances, in turn, can be used to determine the overall structure of the protein. With unlabeled protein, the usual procedure is to record a set of two-dimensional homonuclear nuclear magnetic resonance experiments through correlation spectroscopy, COSI, of which several types include conventional correlation spectroscopy, total correlation spectroscopy, TOXI, and nuclear overhauser effect spectroscopy, NOSI. The COSI and TOXI spectra above are representative of an amino acid such as glutamate or methionine, showing proton correlations. The TOXI shows off diagonal cross peaks between all the protons in the spectrum, but COSI only has cross peaks between neighbors. Note that these spectra are only for one single amino acid. The complexity of the spectra dramatically increases when analyzing a molecule the size of a protein. If recombinant proteins can be produced, the resulting protein can be labeled with nitrogen-15 or carbon-13 to allow for more detailed experimentation, such as heteronuclear single quantum coherence spectroscopy, HSQC, the most commonly performed N15 experiment is the H1N15 HSQC. Each peak in the spectrum represents a bonded nitrogen-hydrogen pair with its two coordinates corresponding to the chemical shifts of the hydrogen and the nitrogen atoms. This diagram shows a typical workflow for determining a 3D structure of a protein using NMR. This starts with the labeling of a recombinant protein with carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 during the growth of the bacteria. The protein is then purified. 
And in this case, specific subunits of the protein are expressed separately and then reassembled together within a test tube. The assembled protein is then analyzed by NMR. Data interpretation allows the recreation of the 3D structure. Cryogenic electron microscopy, cryo-EM, has recently emerged as a powerful technique in structural biology that is capable of delivering high-resolution density maps of macromolecular structures. Resolutions approaching 1.5 angstroms are now possible, and the regeneration of very large macromolecular structures are possible. In this technique, protein suspensions are frozen on 3 mm diameter transmission electron microscope support grids made from a conductive material, such as copper or gold, that are coated with a carbon film with a regular array of perforations 1 to 2 micrometers in diameter. A total of 3 to 5 microliters of sample is loaded onto the grid, which is then immediately blotted with filter paper with the aim of creating a film of buffer protein on the grid that, when frozen, will be thin enough for the electron beam to penetrate. Optimizing the ice thickness is a vital step in sample preparation as thicker layers of ice increase the probability that the incident electron will undergo multiple scattering events and thereby reduce the image quality. The high resolution structure of lumazine synthase is shown here as an example. Obtaining pure, highly concentrated protein is a major setback for X-ray crystallography and NMR spectroscopy, whereas cryoelectron microscopy does not require as much protein. NMR has some advantages as the protein remains in a fluid system rather than crystallized or frozen as in the other two methods. Thus, it may have a more realistic 3D structure. However, X-ray crystallography and cryoelectron microscopy can produce really high resolution images and cryoelectron microscopy can yield structures for very large macromolecular models. The final section of Chapter 3 deals with proteome analysis. Proteomics deals with the study of all the proteins expressed within a system and will vary from cell type to cell type within an organism. The proteome that is expressed within an organism will be a composition of the genetic makeup of the organism and the environmental factors that the organism is exposed to. The proteome within an organism can affect physical characteristics and the overall health and robustness. Throughout the remainder of this course, we will spend a lot of time exploring the control of gene expression and protein function.